Hi everyone, I'm Jessica with The Common Stack here with another edition of the Trusted Seed Spotlight. And we are so honored to welcome our Trusted Seed member, Trent McGonaghy of Ocean Protocol. And he's working on several really exciting projects in the token engineering space and has been around for a long time. Welcome Trent, so nice to have you. Hello, thanks for having me. Where did you grow up and how did you end up down the token engineering rabbit hole? Yeah, so it seems like many of my experiences actually led uh, to token engineering and, and commons and so on. Um, I grew up in rural Canada, a province called Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, then I, I studied engineering and computer science in undergrad. And then I did uh, two startups and a PhD all in the world of AI for designing computer chips. And finally, for the last many, many years, I've worked in blockchain. So that's the very, very quick summary. Um, but then I'll, I'll zoom in on a few things that kind of le lead to token engineering. So um, in rural Canada, where I grew up, um, everything is a co-op. The local gro grocery store is a co-op. Um, the local bank is a co-op. The local, um, it's actually not quite local, the whole province had a co-op for farmers to get together and collectively market their grain, um, to, to market it, to distribute it, to, to ship it to Japan, et cetera. So uh, why was this? Because basically overall, it was, the whole area was so remote that if you didn't work together, you would probably freeze to death in the winter. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, yeah, remote, there's not that many yeah. people. There's 1 million people in a province that's three times the size of Norway, right? So co-ops everywhere. Uh, it was also the first jurisdiction in the world that introduced universal healthcare. So um, it was basically kind of, in, you know, something in the blood or in the water or something, just everyone has this sort of paradigm <laughs> of working together. But at the same time, yeah, which, which is really great, right? But at the same time, you know, capitalism is in full force, right? My father is a farmer and, you know, he had, he ran the farm like a company, right? And then uh, with my mother, and then he and my mother also ran a tour company, a for-profit business. So, um, you know, you these things can play well together. Um, and that's completely, you know, a good thing. And co-ops themselves are for profit, right? Just all each member gets the same dividend. So, you know, I grew up with that um, and saw the, the power of sort of collectively working together to achieve some good that benefits your community. Um, then in university, you know, I guess, you know, I studied engineering and computer science, really got into AI, hacking AI, AI on the side and all that. You know, this is the late 90s that I graduated. So there was not really any real jobs in AI. Um, so uh, I started a company that did AI for uh, electrical engineering uh, for designing computer chips um, because I saw that, you know, that was kind of the future, you know, rather than manually designing, why not do it automatically if you can? And um, and as I kind of worked on in, in that industry for, you know, um, from the late 90s to the, the mid uh, 2010s, um, I, I was using AI to create these tools um, to for people to design computer chips. So it wasn't sort of AI taking the jobs of electrical engineers. It was AI uh, as, as part of embedded into CAD tools, computer-aided design tools, um, to, to design these systems. And these systems, you know, they were analog uh, systems, they were memory systems, they were mixed signal systems of analog and digital and so on. Um, and, you know, when you go to manufacture one, if you're Qualcomm or something, and you go to manufacture one of these things, um, it costs about $25 million to, to do a single spin of silicon. And if your design screws up, that $25 million is gone, poof, right? And and if you screw it up, you know, two or three times in a row, then you've lost your window of time to market and you lose that billion dollar market opportunity, right? Like the next generation chip for the next generation cell phone, right? So you better get it right that first time or at least the second time. How do you do this? Well, it's, you know, it doesn't take much to realize that better software to do this can really, really help, right? So you need to simulate the circuit. And in fact, some of the world's first good simulators came out in the early 70s, Spice out of Berkeley and stuff. Um, but then on top of that, you need to verify it, right? So you need to say, okay, how does it work? Um, how does it do in response to changes in temperature, et cetera, and changes in manufacturing variation, tolerances, all that, as well as changes to the design itself, the circuit design. So you need to you know, simulate all those different effects, see what happens, um, and then also you know, try to get to a better design. And you need to do this for analog and digital and memory. And the tools for each are a little bit different, right? So this is what I worked on for a long time. And it turns out that if you want to do a good job, it can take a long, long, long time, right? You could type a cluster um, of a thousand machines for a month and still not have anything verified well. But if you use the right AI tricks in the right place, then you can do this in like 10 minutes on a laptop. And this is what we would do. So that was where I spent my time building CAD tools for the sort of interface, uh, this sort of symbiosis between man and machine, if you will. And so, you know, when it came time to blockchain, um, to do bl blockchain work, at first, you know, we were doing a scribe, which is IP on the blockchain. Then we got into BigchainDB, um, solving scalability issues, focusing on leveraging big data databases. But with Ocean, 
which has you know been my focus for the last few years now. It's really about leveraging the incentives of of um, that blockchain systems can can wire are in, and incentives. The design of incentives is a lot like design of analog circuits. So then you can say, well, what tools can you people use for analog circuits that we can apply here? And this is basically where a lot of my contribution to token engineering has come in. So like different heuristics to, to design those uh, heuristics and strategies to design those circuits in the first place, but then also to verify them and to bring them into market and so on. So that's sort of been, you know, that's the summary of kind of where I came from and my background that helped to, I think, you know, hopefully make a contribution to, to the field of token engineering. Yeah, you're working on so many things. You also built your own simulation tool. Um, so what do you see as some of the most exciting things happening, and especially in the DAO space as well, as we look up, um, to decentralized organizations and have you know better coordination mechanisms to solve some of the world's biggest problems? What are you seeing across the space that is inspiring you every day to jump out of bed and go to work? You know, to me, it's not about what you see day to day. It's sort of um, what you envision, how the future could be. And, um, you know, so then like, what are the big general purpose technologies that can act as big levers on, on humanity to make humanity for the be better? Um, two of the biggest levers of all are AI and blockchain, right? So, you know, a small, small team of people can make a massive difference if they apply technology in the right place. It's like a teeter-totter, right? One end of the teeter-totter, you push down just a little bit and it can make the other end move up a lot because there's that lever in between, right? It, it acts like a lever. So, so basically blockchains uh, are a massive lever and AI, and I, I'm you know drawing on my experience in AI and blockchain to t help move both levers towards you know a better world, if you will. But also I, I like, you know because I'm a, a big nerd, I like to define things more precisely. So to me, the kind of ideal is, um, universal self-actualization where every single human on the planet gets the opportunity to self-actualize. Um, so not just, you know, barely getting by um, with basic needs met, but all the way up Maslow's hierarchy. So basic needs met of food, clothing, shelter, water, but then also health, good health, good education, uh, and then beyond, right? Um, all the way up to being able to like, you know, chase your dreams and do what you're dreaming of doing. Some people dream of, you know, being a novelist, other people, great teachers, maybe other people simply playing video games in the basement. It's up to them and that's okay. But to basically make it possible for people to, to chase these opportunities individually, but also collectively, right? And so then, you know, how can blockchain help here? Um, I see that blockchain, uh, quite a few things, but the summary is um, decentralized, immutable assets and incentives, those four things. And I can unpack those, but I, I, I so decentralized as in we can create um, public utility networks uh, to to manifest um, these these machines. That's what decentralized can do. Permissionless decentralized. Um, um, immutable means when we write to the blockchain, it's there for good. Um, assets. If you have a private key to something, you own that thing, right? So you can have a private key to uh, some ether or Bitcoin or Ocean tokens or whatever, then you own that thing. Or data tokens, which is what we're doing with Ocean, right? So you can you know hold data assets in your crypto wallets. And then finally, incentives. And of the four things, you know, decentralized, immutable assets and incentives, incentives are probably the most powerful thing about blockchains, right? Blockchains are incentive machines. You can get people to do stuff, right? It, um, with the, the right de design of incentives. And this is kind of like wildly powerful. Before, you know, with the right dynamics design, you could get an analog circuit to do things, right? To, to you know, to amplify uh, a song or something in a speaker. But now using the same ideas, using the same techniques, you can actually help to structure behavior of humans and fortunately, the people that first realized this uh, really want to do good for the world. So we're, we're basically saying, OK, we have these really powerful technologies, um, blockchain and, and realizing that blockchains are incentive machines. How can we use these incentives to to make the world a better place towards, you know, ultimately, you know, one of the big ones, of course, is sort of Moloch, the problem of how do you coordinate humans? Right. And, you know, many people talk about this. A, a lot of 2020 um, failures are failures of coordination, right? You know, everyone knows that Facebook is data mining them, but no one can coordinate enough to have a concentrated um, pushback to Facebook. And so as a specific example with Ocean, we are, um, you know, creating data tokens and technologies on top so that people can coordinate around pushing back on Facebook and the like with things like data DAOs, you know, to manifest data trusts, data co-ops for collective bargaining to actually have real leverage against Facebook, right? To, to stand up for ourselves towards self-actualization. There is tremendous wealth in our data that wealth should go to the people. That's so. So that's an example, right? And um, so, I mean, what are the things that are inspiring me day to day? Then, um, I just the, the technology. Uh, you know, it's been growing exponentially for for years, even with Ethereum. And I'm a big fan of Ethereum. And you know, it didn't look like it was changing much, changing much, changing much, and then suddenly it changed a lot. But this is just how exponentials work, right? So now we've sort of crossed the knee of the curve, where it feels like there's a ton happening every single day. 
Um, and that's great news. So, you know, the, the DAO technology has matured a lot with, with things like Aragon and DAO stack and Moloch, all these things, really great technologies that, you know, people are finally leveraging in big ways. So I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about, you know, the fact all these developments around token engineering itself um, to help improve the practice of designing incentive systems to verify with things like CAD CAD and then new building blocks. Um, you know, any good engineering field has a, has a bunch of building blocks that you connect together, right? In circuit land, you have transistors and resistors and capacitors that then, then you connect to higher levels, things like amplifiers and so on. Same thing that's happening in token engineering, right? You know, we have lower level primitives that build up into things like bonding curves and many variants of that, you know, token curated re registries, different sorts of DAOs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the building blocks that end up being really useful are going to keep getting used, you know, more and more and more. And that's exciting. So in token engineering is maturing as a field bit by bit by bit. And, and I think a really healthy way. And um, that, that to me is probably the most exciting thing that we're on track to change the world. <laughs> that's the summary. <laughs> There's a lot of positive things happening and um, reassuring shifts that are seeming to take place and hit that exponential that you're talking about. But what are the, some of the challenges that we're still facing and what do you still need for um, things like Ocean to really take off? You know, I think the goal, if you're trying to build a public utility network, the goal is ubiquity, right? Just like, you know, the internet has, itself has ubiquity, like the TCP protocols, as well as the World of Web has ubiquity, um, as well. Uh, and as well, unfortunately, some of the things built on top of the web, like Facebook, um, having ubiquity, right? So the goal for Ocean is ubiquity because we see that um, it can be a very strong lever to help people, um, you know, regain control of their data to ha to, as part of their overall um, sovereignty, right? So personal sovereignty, company sovereignty, national sovereignty is really, you know, control of the data is a key part of that. Um, what are the challenges holding us back? I would say um, there's nothing magical about to, to what we can see, there's nothing magical. It's just a question of building a product um, that um, people want to use. That is a product that is truly useful, right? And it takes time, right? Because at first, you know, it's a more vague idea. So you start building things and then you talk to people and you see how they're trying to use your tool and you keep um, iterating and, and iterating and iterating. So, you know, we're kind of in that process. Um, we're, you know, we we shipped, we built and shipped to V1, we built and shipped to V2, and each and now we're about to, to ship our V3. And with each release, it's um, addressing some of the pain points and concerns that people had from previous versions. For example, V2, people were really concerned about selling data where they were lose, worried about data escapes. You know, if if my if um, you know if my data escapes, I, I lose control of it. Um, what do I do then? And our answer in V2 was simply bring um, bring compute to the data. So. Um, the data never ever leads, leaves your phone or leaves your premises, yet at the same time, you can get benefit from it um, for people building AI models to extract value, et cetera. So people are still willing to buy that data and then do compute locally on your phone or wherever. So that's an example that we have for V2. For V3, um, uh, we see basically V1 and V2 were a little too heavy. Uh, so with V3, we said, let's tokenize every single data set. And now that we've had all these great tools built with, with for ERC-20 and for things like wallets and for um, decentralized exchanges um, and for DAOs, all of these th things can now be leveraged for data itself, right? So data wallets, you know, MetaMask becomes a data wallet. Balancer DEX becomes a data exchange. Um, Aragon tooling becomes data DAOs uh, for data co-ops. And so this actually addresses as many of the questions and many of the goals we've had will be enough. We'll see, right? Um, it's going to, you know, even if it grows exponentially, the number of users is still relatively low. So um, we, we will see, right? In three months, six months, 12 months. You've had a lot of success in all your various uh, roles throughout the years. Do you have uh, what would be, you know, one few words of wisdom or advice for our community at large and how we move forward in developing some of these solutions? Well, I think, you know, so thank you. I think the first thing is just know what you want, right? right? Have a vision of where you want to be, right? You know, um, and and then ha be as tenacious as you can to achieve it, right? And to me, tenacity is the most important thing. You know, you have to have the skills. If you don't have the skills, go and get the skills. And this is part of tenacity. Um, if you don't feel like you have the energy, then, you know, um, eat better and exercise more. Um, if you don't have the time, then do better time management, right? Like, you know, we're only on the earth for a certain, a certain amount of time. So, you know, focus matters, right? Um, simplicity matters, all these things. 
So at the end of the day, know what you want and then have the tenacity to go for it. Wonderful words. Thank you so much, Trent. Appreciate you joining me here for this edition of the Trust Seed Spotlight. And we'll see everybody next time.